Greetings, ladies. It's good to meet with you. I can think of no better cause than the cause of liberty. I just wanted to start off so you kind of know our little bit of our claim to fame here. I was actually working on a greenhouse, and uh, I get this text. Show me your, give me your stuff so I can take it up and introduce it to Glenn Beck. And so he introduced it a little bit, and then Glenn Beck says, give your best person that he wanted to have on prophecy, come up and teach him. So I'm working on this greenhouse, and I get this text, what are you doing day after tomorrow? And I was like, I don't know, what am I doing? And he says, can you go up and meet with Glenn Beck? And I'm like, oh, sure, I can do that. You know, I can jump in there and go. And, and we went up to, <clears throat> up to his ranch. We met with Glenn Beck, and what a bond instantly between, I mean, I, I fell in love with the man, and we ended up, when we first got there, I asked him, I says, how long do you got? And he says, well, I've got to, uh, I've got an appointment at 3, and 3.30 right in there, and I got to go. And so I thought, well, we'll go as best we can, and I'll just try to push through. Well, he just blew through his appointments, and he just stayed with us clear for five and a half hours. We spent with, <laughs> we spent with Glenn Beck straight, and uh, you know his time. Anyway, so um, this is a picture at his ranch. This is Ron and I and him and his, Glenn and his wife. Um, what's that? It's in Idaho. I'll give you that much, but it's kind of his business otherwise. I probably, <laughs> from there, I'm, what? It's in Idaho. He's got a ranch in, in Idaho that he comes up to from time to time. For COVID, he was up there quite a bit. In the course of the talk, and I'll probably talk about this a little more next time, but in the course of the talk, I says, I asked him if there was anything we could do for him, and he was very shocked by that. He's like, most of the time people go see Glenn Beck to ask what he can do for them. And I says, is there anything I can do for you? And, and he was a little taken back by that. And so he, he paused for a minute, and, he, and then he turned back to me. He says, well, what can I do for you? And then I was kind of shocked. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I says, let me, let me pray about it and see if there's anything. And then I says, well, you, you know, Glenn, if you, if you just give me your contact information, and I see anything that maybe you can help me with in the future, and I, I feel like the Lord moves upon me to do that, I can just get a hold of you. And he says, well, like, my personal contact information? <laughs> I says, you're called. You know, if you want to screen me, that's fine. Then I sent him a letter, because he asked me to send picture copies of the photographs to him, email. I sent him a letter, and this is his response back to us. Few people can change the course of another's lives, especially in one afternoon. You have done that for us. Thank you. We are most, more focused and actually more at peace, at least for a while, than we have been for quite some time. Thank you. Now, what to do with this information? It is strange, but I believe that when people find out that he may be near, believers will feel the Spirit as we did and know it to be true. The good news is that he gave us such a clear, concise guidance that if the sequence doesn't start in the next few years, I'm going to say few, he says next couple, we will know. It is just going to be really super bad without a happy ending, smiley face. <laughs> That's, you'd have to hear his show a couple, right after we met with him to kind of get the idea of where he went with it. We feel as though we have known you forever and I have found a long lost brother. Please stay in touch and keep us up to date. I'm working on how to begin to alert those with ears. It's going to be difficult to do in a way that doesn't seem crazy or doomsday, but I think I'm on it. When COVID lets up, we would love to have you do a presentation in Dallas, Glenn Beck. <clears throat> and then he puts his little PSs on there. If you want something you never had, you need to do something you've never done. Every leader is telling a story about what he or she values in a way that they believe. When leaders choose to be positive in the face of intense adversity, the story tends to be widely shared and often repeated. Walt Disney. So. We had a really cool bond with Glenn Beck in that five and a half hours. So I, I sometimes introduce that so you know that, that, that the things we talk about in prophecy is what Rod Meldrum has kind of used as his basis of running. And obviously Glenn Beck was very moved by it also. And I'm not trying to claim anything uh, of our own selves, but only that what the Lord gave to us as our, in our studies, I believe, is profound. 
And as I introduce it to you more next time than this time, if you connect with it the way I think you will, you will have more appreciation for the Word of God and how it speaks to us in very precise ways. Today I'm going to spend some time on Daniel's Hour of Judgment, I call it. Apocalypse of Ezra. But there will be an interval, as it were, a week of years. This is the order of my judgment I made known only to you. In Ezra, he tells us that there's going to be a week of years in this end time scenario. And that is the period of time we're going to most focus in on over this um, two courses of these classes. However, we will do some peripherals, but it's to connect to that week of years. <clears throat> so this time we refer to as the time of Jacob's trouble, this week of years that is going to take place. It is, and I don't know, if any of you been to our website? Okay, good. So this is new to you. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure that I, you know, because I am going to be going over a lot of stuff that you could find on our website also. But because I'm in person, it allows us to, to have a more personal touch to it all, whereas the website's kind of generic in a lot of ways. So, propheticappointments.com. Okay, propheticappointments.com is us. But this week of years that we're referring to, this time frame, this seven year period on this chart that, that we put together is the main focus of what we're gonna be talking about. This period of, of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's last week. It's a seven year period spoken of in the apocalypse of Ezra. It's a seven year period that it's referred to as the Christians would call it the tribulation. Have you heard that word? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've heard the tribulation referred to. And this is in Daniel 9, 26 and 27. This is kind of how this got discovered by us. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And it shall be the end of war, war of desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Now, most of us, when we read Daniel or read Revelation, we go through it and we read it and we go, okay, I got it now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how it goes? <laughs> We're like, oh, yeah, that was easy. <laughs> okay, what? Yeah, just clear as, I like to use the word clear as mud. That's what it really is. You know, you're like, okay, what did I just read? <laughs> okay, <laughs> what is that? Well, this is in connection with the last two verses, which usually I take a lot of time to go through. Like with Glenn Beck, I went through Daniel's prophetic picture of Christ coming the first time, which is in the last few verses that would be above this. I'm not going to take the time to do that with you in order to cover the hour of judgment and the half hour of silence and some of the things I intend to cover today. Because if I did, we'd be here four sessions, okay? And, and four sessions would take to get through it. But just understand that in the last couple of verses, verse 25 and 26, before this, uh, you've got what we refer to as the 70-week prophecy. And that 70 weeks, understand we're talking years, not, not days. Even though it's said 70 weeks, the word is Shavuah in the Hebrew, and the word is in Hebrew that is Shavuah means seven, so seven sabbatical year cycles. So it's 490 year cycle that Daniel is referring to in the previous verses. And in this verse, he's referring to the last one before the Savior comes. This last week, in the midst of the week, the sacrifice of oblation shall cease. So that is kind of a marker that gives us something to narrow in on, and we can dis discern what's going to happen in that last week. So, Carol, mm -hmm. a lot of members are saying that COVID caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's not right, is it? Poppycock, sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. 
Okay, the reason I say that is, is I understand that there's a ton of speculation out there and what it means. And I'll get into this more next time. But in order to understand prophetic pictures given by Daniel and by John, we have to do what Nephi calls have the learning of the Jews. In the Book of Mormon, he says you have to have the learning of the Jews. And they, most of us in our day have forgotten the learning of Jews, just like Nephi said. We don't get it. And the reason we don't get it is because we don't understand the prophetic appointments. And the prophetic appointments are the Moedim. And I'm going to hit that really hard next time. And you'll be able to see that these appointments, these, I like that too, these prophetic times were fulfilled in the past and their markers to be fulfilled. And that one didn't. Oh, we have a dead tabernacles. That's scary. No, 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 no. <laughs> So these seven appointed, what we have been taught almost to forget, the seven feast days of the Lord. Okay, we refer to them as the law of Moses, and therefore it was fulfilled, right? Don't matter anymore, right? Isn't that the common belief? Okay, that... The feast days don't matter. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord did fulfill the law of Moses, and that is a true fact. And therefore, we don't observe the observances that we observed as Israel in the past. But why did he give them in the first place? Why did he command them to be a law forever? Well, you'll come to understand next time, I will get into it very detailed, that that this prophetic times, is a, the feast is a poor translation of the word. It's a very poor translation of the word. It is what the King James translators chose to do when they would come across the word Moedim in ancient scripture. Rather than write the same thing every time, they wanted to use English creatively. And so they would sometimes use synonyms and and different ways to describe the same word. And that word moedim, which means appointed time, okay, in Daniel 8, 19, if you were to read it, it says appointed time, that is also moedim. So understand the appointed time. What was the appointed time? And we're going to get there a little more. What was the appointed time of Passover? What did that represent? She found a battery. <laughs> cool. Okay, what did, what did Passover represent? Why did he command Israel to observe Passover? Any takers? To remember. But remember what? Okay, level one. I agree. Level one. But what, it, what was it? Go ahead. The sparing of the lives of the Jews. Okay, the sparing of the lives. May I give you more? Okay, okay. Passover was a perfect fulfillment of Christ last week. Okay? He, actually, you have to go one back before this, which isn't a, one of the seven, but you have to go one back forth on the 10th of the month, the 10th of the Hebrew month. You've got to think Hebrew now. The triumphal entry. Okay, the triumphal entry was the 10th commanded in Exodus. Okay, it also was his birthday. It's the day of the choosing of the lamb. It was his birthday. The triumphal entry on the 10th of Nisan is, Hebraically speaking, Christ's birthday. Want more information on that one? Watch my presentation on um, the, the star of Bethlehem, a Hebrew wedding in the sky. And it will show you the perfect fulfillment of his birthday. Which one? Yeah, on our calendar. On our calendar? Is it takers? April yes. Okay. But only in the year of his birth and sometimes later. Because the Hebrew calendar and the, and the Gregorian calendar don't always line up. 
just get that out of your head. It's a little hard because we're so we're so Greco Roman. Well, that's all we know. Yeah, we've, we've. So if we wanted to celebrate his birthday, we wouldn't celebrate it April six every year. We celebrate it on Nissan, Nissan ten every year. Nissan okay, Nissan technically Nissan. Hebrew and speaking. So, and the re, I'll, I'll give you just this much real quick. In the Book of Mormon, when they get the signs of his death, it says, and the 33rd year had passed, and it was the fourth day of the first month of the 34th year. Okay? So, it's the fourth day so, since then to the crucifixion, to this day, Passover. Passover was a perfect representation of his crucifixion. Okay? So on, on the crucifixion, we know that he was the lamb slain for the world. And in Gethsemane, he was in Gethsemane, suffering for the sins of the world at the precise time of the year, cyclically speaking, on the anniversary of the angel of death passing over Israel. So it's the precise time. His model is perfect. He is a perfect fulfillment of these appointed times. So, so you understand the way that lines out. And that's the learning of the Jews that Nephi was talking about, that we've forgotten. We've forgotten the learning of the Jews, which means the prophetic appointments, and I'll show that so technicolor next time. You had just as a real quick overview because this is so new to everybody. The three green ones over there, and they happen in the spring. That they're the Passover feast, all lumped together. They call them the Passover. Okay, they all happen within the week of Passover. The three purple ones at the end, Tabernacles, Atonement, and Trumpets. They happen in the fall, and they happen in a week period of time, well, plus a few days. But the, the point is, is that those ones that in the spring were pictures of Christ's first coming, and the ones in the fall are pictures of his second coming. But in a sense, they're all cyclical, meaning they have multiple yeah, fulfillments. Okay, you had the fulfillment of Passover in Exodus, then you have the fulfillment of Passover in... Uh, <clears throat> The time of Christ, when he came the first time, and they will all have a fulfillment again in the end time. All of them. They will all have a role to play, particularly this one, first fruits. Now, what is significant about first fruits is that's the real day we should be celebrating as Christmas. Easter. Or, excuse me, Easter. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a. Yeah, that's, I like that. Good. Okay, okay. First fruits is, and I hate to use the word Easter. It's almost cross grain for me. It's like, it's like, it's like scratching the, the, the nail on the chalkboard, whatever. Because the true history of the word Easter is from the goddess of stare, which is the goddess of fertility, which is, they, yeah, yeah chuck. They would take, babies and sacrifice them and take their blood and dye the eggs red. Okay, so I hate to ruin Easter for you, but, but it is a pagan substitution that Constantine made to blend paganism and Christianity. He was a politician first. And when he couldn't beat the Christians, he decided to compromise with the Christians and then just substitute Christian holidays and and pagan holidays and make them one. That's where we get this. That's where we get Christmas on December 25th, and we get Easter as the resurrection, when the real name should be first fruits, because he was the first fruits of the resurrection on the third day. <clears throat> That's a whole nother presentation, also on the last week of Christ, which goes through and descri uh, describes that last week. <clears throat> Prepare to get the sound ready in a minute, Missy. Just okay. So the question that I'm going to try to address today a little bit is, what is the hour? When he says 
the hour of my judgment has come? What are we talking about? And if we know what the hour is, we should be able to, by deduction, know what the half hour is. Because if you know the hour, half of it is a half hour. Okay? It's kind of simple logic, okay? And so we know that if we address the hour, and I can show to you what the hour is, then the half hour will fall right into place. So we're going to go back and show the historical type of what the hour is for Christ. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour, my time, has not yet come. So he used the word hour, mine hour. Do you think that was a 60-minute period? Was his whole ministry 60 minutes? Okay, so this word in the, in the Greek that was translated as hour is actually translated as time. It's one of those um, King James translators things where they like to substitute different words for that, what, what we're talking about. If I said, you know, my hour hasn't come yet, would you think 60 minutes in the instance of Christ? Or was he really? Because when did this happen? When did John 2, 4? When is that? The wedding in Cana. So at the wedding in Cana, who's the woman? His mother. His mother. So that's almost disrespectful for John to use the word woman instead of mother, you know, his mother. But this is King James translators again. Don't get caught up in, in words that Joe Smith said as far as it is translated correctly, right? So the concept is good. But you got to understand the words are sometimes a little. That he was referred to, that she was referred to when he was on the cross. Yes. It's not meant to be disrespectful in any way. No, that's what I'm trying to say. It's just, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet. He's trying to say, you know, mom, I'm not supposed to be doing miracles yet. You know, I'm in a situation here that. That's going to draw a lot of attention. And, I, you know, my hour is not yet. I have this time frame I'm supposed to fulfill. And if I jump the gun, it's going to make things uncomfortable. And, of course, have you, any of you guys Chosen fans? Yeah. Okay, I love the Chosen. You need to be if you're not. You need to become a Chosen fan. Okay, just because it's so well done, in my opinion. But he gives her those eyes, and he goes, oh, Mom, okay. So he has that relationship with his mother, and, and he performs the miracle at Capernaum and turns the water to wine. And I love that relationship he has with his mother, and they show it well in The Chosen. <clears throat> anyway, that being said, give me half a second. This hour was not yet. What's he saying then? My 60 minutes isn't yet? No, he's not saying that at all. He's saying there's this period of time that I have to fulfill. There is this appointed time. I have to do the things I was commanded to do on those exact days by the Father. Now go ahead. I know we don't have time to go into this. I'm just dropping this little pebble out there. But you notice in John chapter 4, he also calls the woman at the well the woman. Okay? And whenever he used the term, uses the term woman, it's a prophecy about Zion. Okay, so this would be a whole other lesson to do this one. And then Farrell actually has a video. Of the, the woman at the well. The well. A prophetic. He goes through the incredible prophecy. Every word that Jesus and the woman at the well were saying to each other was a prophecy. And it's so, a prophecy to us, uh, particularly. Right. And so I, I was also going to just say, you know, <clears> there, there's so many levels to read every verse. And there's a prophetic level to that verse as well. So now we move down to John 7, and, and they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour, his time, had not yet come. Okay, now we're John 8. The word spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. So we keep getting this description of this time frame, this hour, this appointed time. It's not yet come. And yet he's still doing part of his ministry. He's still working towards it. And then we have a change by the time we hit John 12, which is what people like to refer to as Palm Sunday. Actually, another incorrect term in a sense. But 
It was the triumphal entry. And they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So at this appointed time, this 10th day of Nisan, the 10th day of the first month on the Hebrew spiritual calendar, prophetically referred to in Exodus, that it was the day to choose the lamb, to present the lamb, four days before Passover. <clears throat> On his birth, too, 33 years earlier. So four days before Passover, 33 years earlier, he is born. 33 years later on the triumphal entry, on his birthday, is when he entered Jerusalem in the last week of his life. So it's a perfect fulfillment. He is the, the lamb chosen to be the sacrificial lamb from Exodus to, the, to his time in this mortality. It's all fulfilled perfectly. God doesn't do anything approximate. We might think so, but for him, it was scheduled from the beginning. It was in his appointment book. His appointment book has all been pre-thought out and pre-scheduled. And the reason we don't understand it is because we've lost the understanding of the Hebrews. I like to use the word Hebrews even though Nephi used Jews. Because I think the Jews perverted many of the things that are important about the Hebrew appointed times. And therefore, it has left a bad taste in so many people's mouths because they made him the sacrifice. It's kind of weird that he, I like to use the word checkmate. He checkmated the Jews. In his last week, he literally checkmated them. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what was their law? Blasphemy was punishable by death. So when he proclaimed himself at the triumphal entry and during that time that he was the son of man or the son of God, he was the literal son of God, they didn't have but two choices. They had to receive what he said and make him the son of God or they had to kill him by their own law. And because they were not close enough to the Spirit to know he truly was the Son of God, and because he challenged their, their, their paradigm of thinking, they chose to kill him by their law, because they had to, in order to live the law, if they didn't accept him. And so he checkmated them. Now, did he do that because he wanted them to be punished? Not necessarily. In fact, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do, in a sense. But he knew what he had to do, that he had to be the Passover lamb. He had to be in Gethsemane, and he had to be on the cross. <clears throat> and Jesus answers saying, this hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now the wording has changed. Okay, the wording has changed. Now before the feast of, the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. Now we have a change of wording. We went from my hour is not yet, but right before the feast of Passover, his time has come. On this tenth day, the choosing of the Lamb, his hour has come before Passover. I do another whole video. Unfortunately, this video was the first one I did. I need to redo it because it's got the least technical... Prowess. Yeah, what's the word? Prowess. Yeah, it's just not as smooth as because it was my first video. So it's a little ragged, but it's called Who Sabbath is Sabbath? And in that, I do a video and I present that last week in precision and show you exactly how each day lined out. And that is his hour. Okay, that time frame we're talking about, this last week of Christ, right here, speaking of, 
And this is what I told you. There's your prophetic type, Exodus 12.3. On the 10th day, you're to choose the lamb. Here's the fulfillment, the triumphal entry right there. And then the, it just goes day by day through it all, right down to first fruits, which is the resurrection. And this seven-day period from triumphal entry to resurrection, that's his hour. Mel Gibson referred to it as the week of the passion or the passion of Christ. Okay, what I'm going to show is you see how he has his hour where he enters on the 10th and is resurrected on the 17th. That's the 10th of the Hebrew month. Don't equate that with our calendar or you'll be confused. But that flow, that's his hour. This exact... Um, period of time. He, he said the video is, it is our first one. It's not as good as our last ones, but it's still really good. If you want to understand this, he goes through the short chart on that video. <clears throat> okay, so this is his hour. This is when he fulfilled the most he was sent here to do, which was the presentation, the cru or the Gethsemane, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. All took place in a seven-day period. That was his hour. Seven. A Shavuah. Okay? And it matched the seven-day period of the seven-day Passover uh, celebrations, unleavened bread, and first bread. Yes, all of this matches. The third day being the resurrection. That's a whole big discussion. <coughs> we need to get the sound going, Missy. Are you ready? <laughs> now, I... I spent a lot of time on this, and I, I have to put a disclaimer out here um, that this is a little bit plagiarized, so you have to forgive me for that. Um, but I took s some of the church videos, and I, we do a lot of video editing, and I took some of the church videos, which I think they did a m wonderful job, and The Chosen isn't far enough along I could use theirs. I actually sometimes use their videos, too, to edit for presentations. But in this one, I took the church's video and I edited this out so that I could present to you the, this hour of his life. And I took my favorite music and combined my favorite music with our favorite, with our favorite videos of this time frame so that you can see this, this hour, his hour, fulfilled in beauty. No, I am with you always. Of course, we all know You're that's what it's really all about anyway. When we get right down to it. He fulfilled every detail of the appointed times. From the triumphal entry, then at Passover, as he, as he was on the cross. The high priest in the temple. would finish the day at about three o'clock at the same time Christ was at the end of his day. And he would stop and wipe his hands. And then he would say, I thirst. And they would bring him drink, that he might drink the high priest in the temple. And after he, he drank so that he could clear his throat, he would raise his hands to the square as of the cross, and he would say, it is finished, as the day's sacrifice would be finished on Passover. Christ fulfilled every part therein. And then three days on first fruits, when the high priest, <clears throat> when the high priest was taking and offering the first fruit offering and waving the first fruit offering to the Father, which was 
symbolically the resurrection that happened at Christ's time and later, but at Christ's time as he symbolically would wave the offering, the barley harvest to the Lord or to God, Christ said to Mary, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to the Father and presented the first fruit offering, which was that first resurrection. Every detail <clears throat> of the appointed times he fulfilled to the very letter. He fulfilled it all. These appointed times, these, these feasts as the translators called it, the Hebrew word moedim, moed. God gave it to us for a reason. They're a type and a shadow of things to come, both then and now. And we're going to see, as I progress through here, how, and particularly next time, how those appointed times will be fulfilled precisely again. So Jesus had his hour. Because thou hast kept the words of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So Jesus had his hour, and I just pointed to, it out to you, that seven-day period, that Shavua of days, where he fulfilled his mission for us. Um, we have our hour. We have our time. We have our seven Shavua spoken of in Ezra as a week of years. <clears throat> Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the Jews, and the faith of Jesus, the Christians. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. So at this point in time, I like to get into the fear factor. When you come into these last days, are you a little afraid, maybe? Are we afraid just a little bit? Yeah. I kind of get it. But I want to encourage you. Number one, this is going to sound a little cold. I don't mean it to. Everybody dies. Okay? We all got to get there. I sit at my mother's bedside and watched her pass. And she passed with courage. I watched my father die from cancer. Everybody dies. A hero dies but once. A coward a thousand, I, don't, I said it backwards. A, a coward dies a thousand deaths. A hero but one. If you're afraid, you're already dying anyway. <laughs> okay, You're already there. You're living it. Just stand valiant. If we're called to die for him, die for him bravely. If you're given the opportunity to live for him, live for him valiantly. Don't be afraid. Because everybody's got to get dead. I'm sorry. We, <laughs> you know, we're all going there someday. Now, I, I know some of us like to put it off, and, we like, and I get that. I get the fact that sometimes we can be a little afraid. What did he say? I'm the resurrection. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Yet shall he live. You see, it's all about how we do it. We're all going to go the same direction. The, all men go. All women go. Fear not. 
Live for him. Stand valiant for him. In our day, that's our call. Here's the patience of the saints. <clears throat> okay, little children, it is the last time, same word as hour, by the way, translated by the King James, it is the last hour, or it is the last time, as ye have heard, that the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby ye, we, excuse me, we know that is the last time. This word for time here is translated as season, time, hour. Don't lock it into a 60-minute period. Think of it as a marker. So Christ hour particularly was that last week of his life. Our hour is coming shortly. It's okay. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to take courage in his example and know that he lives and that's, that's why we're here. We all want the good news. And the good news is that he lives and that he sacrificed for us. And there's really, I mean, my dad dying from cancer wasn't fun to watch. But he died true. And so we had a celebration for him, in honor of him. I thought I turned that off. No, don't worry about it. <clears throat> I thought I turned it on airplane mode. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not trying to be morbid here. I'm simply trying to say, hey, courage, take. For goodness sake, and when you're out of courage and you're ready to break, you got a father and sister. What I'm trying to tell you is, we got the best news of the world. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need not fear. <clears throat> anyway, I'm just trying to show you the word. Don't get caught up in this hour thing, and this half hour, the way we have interpreted it in the past. <clears throat> okay. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment is come. That time frame in which the world is going to be judged. And worship, not the beast or his image, that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And that, I kind of mumbled that together, but you're following, I hope. Here is the patience of the saints, and here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead would die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their work, works to follow them. So if our works are good, we're going to come forth with him. And I'll show you that later. And he looked and I beheld white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one like unto the Son of Man, having a head of gold on his head a gold crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat in the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time, hour, is come to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now I don't know about all of you, but I assume that you all kind of notice things are getting a little different quite rapidly. Okay, things are changing, okay? Things are moving towards kind of a different thing than we've been used to most of our lives. And I, we thought it was bad before, I know that. Many people... That verse is ripe in iniquity. <laughs> ripe, yeah. For the harvest is ready, is ripe. Yeah, we're in a situation, you know, and you, you notice the colors that we made this. You got the, the, the spring harvest, and then you got the summer and then you got the fall harvest. But the fall harvest is, we made purple because it's referred to as the, one of the references is the grape harvest. Okay, the first harvest was barley. Okay, in the temple, ancient temple. Barley could just be sifted in the wind and the chaff would blow off. 
that that's how simple barley was to refine as the chaff would usually blow off. Now, what harvest are we? What does the doctor and covenants say all of us? Summertime, grain. Wheat. Wheat. The wheat harvest. We are the wheat. Wheat's a little more stubborn. You have to kind of thump it a little, and thrash it a little, and knock it around a little. And, you know, we kind of are that. We, we kind of have to be thumped and knocked and thrashed a little to get the chaff off. The fall harvest will be the grape harvest or the crushing harvest. That is the time of tribulation. That's for those who just wouldn't get it any other way. And they have to go through a crushing. And they have to, to be harvested that way. Now, we don't want to be that harvest, the crushing harvest, if we can help it. And we, I will kind of show you, and I'm just going to ask this question kind of preliminary, and then I'm going to show it later. Do you believe in the rapture? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Mostly consensus, yes? yes. Okay. So, we'll be lifted up. There is a rapture. It's not necessarily the way the Christians say the rapture is. It's more of a resurrection and a... Um, it's appointment. Yes, it is an appointment. It's actually this one again, believe it or not. The resurrection kind of appointment. But that, that appointment that is a resurrection, that what the Christians refer to as the rapture or what we would refer to as a resurrection and a translation, okay, we're going to go through that. And it's very clear that we get out of the worst of it. That doesn't mean we get out of all of it. But we get out of the worst of it. That three and a half last year portion, which is referred to as the wrath. If we do as we should, and if we live as we should, he catches us out of that part. And we get to miss, so to speak, that last three and a half years, at least on this mortal portion. I think we'll still have a service to do. But it won't be in the midst of it, so to speak, except for by choice when we go to save people out of it. So, the hour of his judgment has come to reap the earth. We see that this hour is referring to, and I will get to show you, uh, in the last week of Christ, he had the seven day period, but then he had Passover, which was where he actually performed both sacrifices. And why do I say both? Okay, the Hebrew day, what is it? Evening and morning. Okay, it's not midnight, midnight. It's evening to evening. So, he has the Last Supper, which was a Seder, by the way. It was a Passover Seder. Then he goes into Gethsemane, suffers at the midnight hour at the same time the angel of death passed over. Later that day at 9 o'clock in the morning, he is on the cross. And six hours later, he is off the cross. All on Passover. Exactly fulfilled. Every letter of the way it was revealed. Now let's get back to the connection on our side of it. I've kind of showed you his fulfillment of his hour first time. Now we're going to go to our scripture that kind of points to when this all takes place. This is in Mark. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which is the first verse I opened up with. This is that first verse in Daniel 9. <clears throat> Daniel prophet standing where it ought not. Let him that readeth understand. Then let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains. So when you see this event, flee to the mountains. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he has shortened those days. So he's given us hope here that we're not going to go through a whole, the full wrath of it all. And here's the, here's the scriptures that back up this um, rapture event or this transformation event, this translation event. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. So in Thessalonians, he's telling us this event that takes place, we're going to be caught up in a rapture type event, okay? It's probably, uh, in, in the, most of the time in Mormon circles, you think, oh, the rapture, that's kind of a Christian thing. But the truth of it is, there is a precedence for it, scripturally speaking. <clears throat> There's it in DNC 88, and that's why I'm saying it is definitely Mormon doctrine. This is in DNC 88 in Revelation. And all things shall be in commotion, and surely men's hearts shall fail them, for fear shall come upon all people. And the angel shall fly through the midst of heaven, crying with a loud voice, sounding the trump of God, saying, Prepare ye, prepare ye, O inhabitants of the earth, for the judgment of our God is come. Behold and lo, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And immediately there shall be a great sign in heaven, and all people shall see it together. Now that great sign... I believe we've had one and we're still going to have one, if that makes any sense. Meaning, we have a sign of the sign and there's, there's some uh, precedence for that in things we understand that there's signs of other things that are the things. <laughs> Does that make sense? You got that. Did you get that? I hope you're up with me. I was speaking in code for some of those. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, for those who understand. We're going to get there, by the way. Yep. Okay. okay. So this is a sign that was very, that came just recently. And you pro everybody talked about it, and then it went by, and nobody thinks anything of it, right? We, we think, oh, the sign, oh, well, nothing happened, so no big deal. Well, that's not what we should be thinking. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. So that sign happened over the course of a year. Most of you probably heard about it. Okay, the sign of Revelation 12. There is something I need to clear up about that because a lot of people think that sign was just <coughs> trumpets 2017. A lot of people think that that's when the sign was. Well, the sign was actually a year. That video I just showed you was the sky and Trumpets 2016. Okay, and Trumpets 2016 is when the sign began, 
when the moon was right at her foot, right at the woman's foot, the woman clothed in the sun. Now, you know, whenever you read that in the past, you kind of go, woman clothed in the sun? What are you talking about, John? Well, now we kind of know. A woman clothed in the sun means that the woman was actually bled out by the sun. You couldn't actually see it. Okay? Because the sun was behind. I'll, let me go back there again and I'll show you just enough so you can see that. See the sun? In heaven. A woman clothed. Okay? So the woman was actually bled out by the sun. You actually couldn't see that with your naked eye. That sign you couldn't actually observe, except for with modern astronomy. That's why in times past, they kind of got going, what in the world does that mean? Woman clothed in the sun? Well, that means the sun was in the middle of her. So you wouldn't see it because it's daytime. But because of modern astronomy, we know that that woman was clothed to the sun in 2016 on trumpets on this day. Okay, she was clothed in the sun and the moon was right at her feet. And then over the course of the next year, Jupiter entered her womb, went into retrograde motion. Do you know what retrograde motion is? Okay, do you want me to explain or you okay? Okay. So, went into retrograde motion and it stayed there nine months and then was delivered on trumpets a year later. So, we had this wonderful sign in the heavens and everybody goes, ah, the woman, it's done. Revelation 12 is done. Okay, well, no. That's the sign of it being done. <laughs> okay, it's not done yet. The sign was real, the event was real, but it's kind of the marker saying, okay, here it comes. It's going to happen. Joe Smith actually said that that sign was a marker of the servant in some form, or the kingdom of God is what he actually said. It was a marker that the kingdom was going to come forth. So, <clears throat> now, that's a whole other discussion. I know in the church many times we teach that, that the the church is the kingdom, and I want to tell you that's not doctrinally completely correct. It's only partially true. The kingdom encompasses, it's more political in nature, and the church is the, um, I like to use, what's the word? Political and spiritual. Para, yeah, political and spiritual. Don't, don't think it's all one, of, one thing, although they should be united. So, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's a discussion that would take an hour or two. <laughs> okay, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> but. <laughs> okay. Okay. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains. It's a scary time, kind of, right? This time, the last three and a half years of tribulation. And said into the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us on the face of him that sitteth upon the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, that second half of tribulation, that second half of the, of the seven-year block, in Scripture, you can find it almost always referring to the wrath. That's when... All the stuff you read in the book of Revelation, starting from about chapter 8. Well, you can even go back to the seals a little bit. But that's when all of the big bad stuff that Joseph Smith said was after the opening of the seventh seal. Meaning after the millennium starts. Now, many can say that the millennium starts, Christ comes, poof, every, all evil's gone. We're home free, Right? <laughs> comes with the clouds, it's all over, right? Is that, isn't that what we kind of grew up thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I grew up thinking that. Mm -hmm. But Joseph Smith in DNC 77 says, no, at the beginning, it's when he's going to clean the mess up. At the beginning of the 7,000 years, not, not before an ending. Of the, no, it kind of starts 
when the millennium starts. That's when he starts cleaning up the mess. The th yeah, the judgment comes, and I'm actually going to get here, I think, if I remember right. So you're saying it's in the beginning of the seventh seal? Absolutely. I think it's open, don't you? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to leave that open for just a minute, because uh, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to jump the gun, because Ron and I have a philosophy, and sometimes we don't adhere to it exactly, but we try to adhere to it. And that is, if we can't show it, we don't say it. And the reason we do that is because, from our perspective, our opinion doesn't really matter. Okay? My opinion doesn't really matter. Scripture and the Word of God is what matters. The Word of God, in fact, was so important that Lehi risked his son's life to send them back into harm way, harm's way to get the brass plates. It was so important to have the word of God as a founding point that he would risk the lives of his sons. And we know from the tree of life that the rod you're supposed to hang on to is what? The word of God. The word of God. Exactly. So it is important that we stay to the scriptures. And that's what Ron and I try to do religiously is not vary too much out into our opinion because our opinion doesn't really matter. God's opinion matters. While we're talking about the wrath, I just, you probably all know this with Dr. Alvin Giliotti and, and all of his works, but the wrath is a person. He's personified in, uh, in He's both. Isaiah. I mean, it's so a person right and an event. Right here in, in Isaiah 10, 5, he says, Hail the Assyrian. He's the Antichrist in the end time in Isaiah. Okay. Hail the Assyrian, the rod of my anger. He is a staff, my wrath in their hands. So he, when it says God's wrath, it's talking about the Antichrist and his allies and the work that they will do um, to for the wicked to cleanse the wick to destroy the wicked. And so it, it's really important to understand that that wrath is that time period when he is in power. And so I the Antichrist. The Antichrist, the king of Assyria in Isaiah, the Daniel's abomination of desolation. Um, He's the one that performs that abomination of desolation. Right. 